So this summer, uh, I'm preaching on God's presence in everyday things and how an understanding of, our, of Scripture and our theology can help us see Jesus in places that we don't always notice Him. Now, today's topic will probably end up being the most popular one of the summer because it's food. And I figured that'd be good for June 23rd since mid-June is typically the peak of freestone peach season. Now, hopefully you've all had the chance to get some peaches already. But if not, maybe this sermon will help you have a holier enjoyment of them. When you want to look for food in the Bible, you don't have to go very far. Just as food is a necessary part of life, food pops up in the Bible all the time. So because food is everywhere in Scripture, I've picked a passage from the start of the Bible and a passage from the end of the Bible, and I will hit on some others in between. So let me pray as we get into our brief Scripture passages. Heavenly Father, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds, even our mouths and stomachs, so that we may receive what you provide through your word, through your daily provision, your nourishment in body and spirit that you long to give us. Help us to receive it, help us to share it, and spread your good news in Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. The first passage is Genesis 1, very first chapter of the Bible, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Second passage is from Revelation 22, the last chapter in the Bible. Revelation 22, 1 through 3. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's an unwritten rule for planning church events. And that rule is that if you have food, people will come. God obviously knew about that rule because he put food at the very beginning and he put food at the very end. And he put food a lot of places in between. Food is obviously a necessary part of life. So it probably isn't that strange to wonder how God is active in food. Jesus did a lot of his work around the dinner table, and he even taught us to pray about food. He said, give us this day our daily bread. We just prayed that. Give us this day our daily bread. In the prayer that Jesus taught us, he taught us to pray about food, that God would provide it. But there's more to food than just having it and receiving it. Food is more than just a physical need. And food can enrich our relation. I'm getting on food, and he's getting upset already. (laughs) Food is more than just a physical need. It can enrich our relationship with God in ways beyond simply whether or not God is providing it. Even that line in the Lord's Prayer is more than just the providing of food. We ask God to give us our daily bread. The word daily is even more important than the word bread. And when I was a kid and I was first learning the Lord's Prayer, there was a restaurant in our town that we went to weekly called Cocosa's Deli. They had fresh bread, and I distinctly remember my parents teaching me the Lord's Prayer, and when they wanted me to repeat after them, give us this day our daily bread, I asked if God was giving us Cocosa's Deli bread, bread from the deli that we went to every week. And my mom gently explained the difference between daily and a deli, and that we were not asking Jesus to give us bread from the deli. And I remember being really disappointed that we couldn't have bread from the deli. It was just any old bread. But that's the word that might be most important in this phrase, daily. The emphasis is on relying on God for our daily needs, and it's a reference back to the Exodus some of the earliest books of the Bible, when God literally provided daily bread 
to the people as he was leading them through the wilderness from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. The Exodus was about God forming the Israelites into being his people, forming them in all kinds of ways, from how they behaved, what they believed, the laws that they followed, even to the makeup of their bodies that, was, that, that were built by the food that he was providing them. And the basis for that formation was daily reliance on God for the most fundamental of needs. They were wandering in the desert. Not a lot grew out there, so God provided food. But today, when it comes to food, we live in an atmosphere of abundance. Most people around us don't have to worry a lot about whether or not we are going to eat. We might worry about what we're going to eat or how we're going to get it and prepare it, but we don't worry that we won't eat. At the same time, there are a lot of hungry people around us. There are a lot of people who don't have food. If you've volunteered down at Kimona or Gap or gone on mission trips, you have seen a lot of people who don't have food. If you are a teacher or you work in the school system or if you work in the medical field, I'm sure, you know it's not unusual for children who have been fairly healthy most of the school year to come back from summer vacation looking gaunt and underfed because they relied on school for getting enough nutrition and nourishment. So our local ministries interact with people of all ages who don't have food and a lot of you work in areas where you encounter those folks. There are many of them around us and maybe even some among us as well. But the problem that we face isn't a lack of food in general it's the inability to purchase food or to have transportation to get food. Maybe some lifestyle choices that don't prioritize food and nourishment. We've got plenty of food, restaurants and grocery stores all around us, but not everyone can get it. So it's not quite the same thing that the Israelites were experiencing. Now there are plenty of places around the world where food is just not available and hunger is rampant. We've got plenty of problems with hunger around us here, but the actual existence of food isn't one of them. It's being able to access it, to use it, and to use it well. So the need for daily bread that sustains us is something that might be a little bit foreign to us, at least by comparison to the Israelites. But the story of the Exodus and the one just before it in the Old Testament show us how the availability of food can skew our relationship with God. The earlier story is the one of Joseph, which goes from Genesis 30 to 50, and I'll be reading those for you now. No, I'm just going to give you the condensed version. I'm not going to read 21 chapters of the Old Testament. Joseph was one of 12 sons of Jacob. He was Jacob's favorite son, but the other sons were not happy about that. Joseph did not do himself any favors with the way he talked to his brothers either, and eventually they hatched a plot to fake his death and sell him to a caravan that was headed down to Egypt. Now, Eventually Joseph ended up in Egypt, where God created a pathway for him to become a trusted advisor to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, Joseph had a dream that there would be a famine, There'd be a famine for seven years, so he told Pharaoh they need to store up seven years of grain. And they did. Pharaoh listened. Sure enough, they stored it up. There was a famine, and when there was a famine, they had plenty. So Joseph was a pretty popular guy in Egypt. Well, when the famine hit, guess who comes wandering down to Egypt? Joseph's brothers. A long story short, they came and asked for a place and for food. They didn't recognize Joseph at first, and he was torn up about it, and he decided he would forgive them, provide them with a home, provide them with food, and that all the people of Jacob and his sons could live in Egypt. Now this story has actually been one of Isla's favorite Bible stories recently, which is really interesting to me. At first, she would just start asking for the story of the colorful jacket 
Because one of the ways that Jacob showed his favoritism to Joseph was by giving him a coat of many colors. And the brothers, again, were not happy about that. So she just started asking for the story of the colorful jacket. But I didn't want to just leave it at the part where they threw him in a hole in the ground. Um, Because I didn't think that was good for Isla to just have that hanging without hearing the rest of the story. So I would skip to the end and say, and he forgave his brothers and told them he loves them and and that he, he welcomed them back when they didn't have any food. And then after maybe the first or second time I did that, she started asking for Jesus and the bread, unprompted by me. She wanted to go and see pictures of Jesus and the bread. So I'd go to the feeding of the 5,000, where you know Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes. And apparently she had, she had had that story in Sunday school not that long ago. And she, was connect, she would always ask for the bread story after that story. And I never, didn't make the connection until preparing for this sermon that you know, I wonder if she associates Joseph providing the food and Jesus providing the food with one another. She's doing the theology in her head there, the connection, the biblical connections of Jesus back to the Old Testament because when the people did not have food, Jesus provided. And just like Joseph forgives his brothers, Jesus forgives us. So the food went along with the forgiveness. The restoration of the relationships go along with the food. So, Joseph gave food to his brothers. The Israelites did well in their new home in Egypt. But eventually, Egypt got a new king who did not remember Joseph, and the king decided to enslave all of the Israelites. So they had to do hard labor. labor, But the food was still good. And God said, this won't do. I want my people to be free and have their own land. So he decided to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and back toward the land where Jacob and his sons had originally lived. Now, at first, it sounded great. God was taking them out of slavery and leading them to a land of milk and honey. But we might think of that as they had honey and milk. But the phrase milk and honey means a lot more than milk and honey. Milk and honey are great, but if the land has milk and honey, then it means that there's enough land and enough productivity to sustain cattle and crops and fruit trees and bees that can pollinate all the fruit trees and the crops. Milk milk and honey aren't just important for what they're eating. When God told the people he was going to take them to a land of milk and honey, that was important because it meant everything else that was going on in the land was bountiful as well. God didn't want to just provide them the end product of food. He wanted to provide them with a place where all needs were sustained. When we think of food, we think of our connection to food, we might not always think of it in that way, in the way that the, the Israelites would have thought of it going through every step of the process of agriculture and cultivation. We think of products, but they would have been more attuned to the entire process. The author Wendell Berry addresses this difference in thinking by saying, eating is an agricultural act. Eating ends the annual drama of the food economy that begins with planting and birth. Most eaters, however, are no longer aware that this is true. They think of food as an agricultural product, perhaps, but they don't think of themselves as participants in agriculture. But we are. We are participants because what is the entire production process for? So when the Israelites heard that God was going to provide them with a land of milk and honey, they weren't just thinking of what they would be eating. They were thinking of every step along that process. God was going to provide at every step. Every step that is packed full of variables and risks. Is the weather going to be good? Are the crops going to grow right? You know, they didn't have seven years of grain stored up. God had to guide every single step of that process. But first they had to go through the wilderness, and they had to eat something called manna every day that God was just laying out for them every morning. And in the midst of that monotony, not even the promise of milk and honey was enough 
to entice the Israelites. After a while of just eating the same thing every day, the food that God had put before them, they got upset, they started complaining because they remembered how good their food was in Egypt. They still realized that the food was a gift, but they had not fully realized that they were supposed to be focused on the giver and not the gift. The generosity and love and purpose and plans of the giver rather than the quality, the tastiness, just the personal feelings about the gift. Way more important than the actual food was the process of God providing and giving it to them. So while God had enabled Joseph to f store up food and provide abundance that lasted through the famine, he also led his people into a land of scarcity so that they could learn to rely on him. The abundance and the quality of the food that they had had detached the Israelites from understanding that God wasn't just giving them a gift every morning. He was forming them to rely on him for their daily bread. Daily bread means daily everything. The ability to grow, the strength to keep going. But it also meant dependence and reliance and being able to see that the giver is more important than the gift. Because whether it's food or whether it's something else, if we learn to rely on God, then we learn that He will provide in some way. If nothing else, we learn to trust and we learn to hope. In our world, we know where to find food. We have plenty of places to get it. Even if lots of people don't have enough of it, we know where it is and we work on ways to try to get it to them. But where do we go when we need God? Well, hopefully church, the Bible, a brother or sister in Christ. But while we can go to the grocery store to get more food, we can't just go to the God store to get more God. We have to cultivate a relationship, a reliance on Him for all of our steps. We also need to communicate a reliance on Him to the world around us. This can also be difficult when we feel like we have an abundance. When we aren't in touch with the fact that God wants to provide on a daily basis, that we need to ask Him and practice asking Him for that daily sustenance, not just food, but any kind of sustenance. And when we aren't in touch with the fact that there are people around us and in the world who need this basic food, we can send a kind of bad message to the world. If we are praying, if we as followers of Jesus are praying for God to give us our daily bread, but we don't have a sense of responsibility for helping to make that a reality for other people, then it looks like we're really falling short or we're being selfish. I recently read a story about a young teenager who wondered what the church's responsibility was for those in the world who were hungry. And this is back in like the 60s or 70s. So this 13-year-old boy came to his pastor after worship one day and said, Pastor, if I raise my finger, will God know which one I'm going to raise even before I raise it? 13-year-old Steve attended church every week with his parents. This particular Sunday, he had stayed after the worship service to ask his pastor this pressing question. The pastor replied, yes, God knows everything. Haunted by the plight of African children suffering from dire famine, Steve then pulled out a Life magazine cover depicting two children tormented by starvation. He asked the logical follow-up, well, does God know about this and what's going to happen to these kids? The pastor gave a similar response. Steve, I know you don't understand, but yes, God knows about that. The author who's telling the story goes on to ask, if you were Steve, would you be satisfied with the pastor's answer to your question? Steve was not. Steve walked out of his congregation that day and never again worshipped at a Christian church. The good, even remarkable news is that Steve was drawn like a magnet to the faith community and his pastor specifically for answers to the dilemmas that most troubled him. The bad, even tragic news is that his pastor's short-sighted response repelled him from the faith community permanently. Even more disheartening is that the pastor failed to grasp the question behind Steve's question. Similar to the young people in our congregation, any congregation in our lives, 
Steve wasn't merely asking an existential question about the nature of suffering. There was a personal element to it. Hunger, when he saw hunger, he was also asking for his own hunger to know and understand. The author goes on, likely behind Steve's rather esoteric inquiry about children in Africa or more personal questions about life and faith. Perhaps Steve wondered why God would allow the suffering he himself had experienced in his 13 years, which included bullying at school, financial struggles at home, and most painfully, being relinquished for adoption by his birth parents. As Steve was trying to make, us make sense of the pain in our world, he wanted his pastor to understand and help him make sense of his own pain. Maybe you've heard of Steve. His last name is Jobs. Steve Jobs founder and CEO of Apple, was a church-going teenager who wrestled with big questions. He sought out his church to help him pin down answers, but his congregation failed to understand what he was really asking. Now, there's not one simple answer to Steve's question. And the author goes on to say, you make this a long conversation a long conversation with him and his family about what might be going on. But there's no simple answer other than God calls us to be the body of Christ on earth and to reach out in mission. But Steve's hunger was not just for bread. And his concern about these children was not just for where are they getting their food. It's does God care about them? How does God communicate His care even when there's not bread? So I'm glad that we as a church have three cents a meal and faith promise and that we've decided to look at hunger as a major need we're called to address along with the, the, along with the preaching of God's Word at places like Gap, along with other needs at places like Kimona. But if we are asking God to give us our daily bread and people literally aren't getting their daily bread, then it opens up a load of other questions about, about how God provides even in the midst of a lack or paucity. After all, daily bread is more than just bread. Food is not the only way we need to be nourished. We see this throughout the New Testament when the Bible urges us to grow in our relationship with Jesus. In Matthew 4.4 4 and Luke 4.4, 4, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3, which says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So even in the desert, there was purpose behind the little bit that God was providing. In Matthew 4.4, 4, and actually Luke 4.4 4 as well, Jesus says this, But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know who Jesus is talking to there, right? Satan. Being tempted to have more than he needed. He was being tempted to have more than what he knew was right for God to provide. And after Jesus establishes this, other writers in the New Testament go into more detail about that spiritual diet that we need to have. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. I think Kelsey quoted 1 Peter a few minutes ago. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. 1 Corinthians 3, 1-2, Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready. Hebrews 5, 12-14 tells us this, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. 
But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Just as there are different literal foods that we can tolerate, and as we grow in our ability to tolerate them over time, there are different levels of engagement with the Holy Spirit that we can tolerate. Different levels of spiritual food that we're able to take as well. We grow in our ability to eat different things, be challenged in new ways. But it's not just our ability to eat, it's our ability to be nourished. Once we allow God to cultivate in us a daily reliance, our hunger starts to change. We start to crave different things. We start to have hunger for the things of God. Just like babies who grow to tolerate more complex foods, we grow to endure and understand more things in the world through a God-shaped vision. And we even find ways to address the potentially spiritually harmful aspects of abundance. One of the most popular spiritual disciplines in the Bible is the discipline of fasting. Intentionally going without food to acknowledge the ways that God provides aside from food. Intentionally going without food in order to focus on God. And the word is fasting because you hold fast to God in the midst of your hunger. God's even given us a spiritual discipline for retraining ourselves and orienting ourselves around relying on Him instead of relying on the abundance that we often have in our lives. So once we allow God to cultivate that daily reliance, our hunger starts to change, and at the same time, we'd be surprised by just how little it might take for us to be nourished by God. A little can go a long way. But the question is, are we looking for it? Are we looking to be nourished? We might be looking for our literal daily bread, but are we always on the lookout for spiritual daily bread? We might have a, an abundance of food that keeps us from getting that sense of daily physical reliance, but do we also have an abundance of activity and busyness that keeps us from having a sense of daily spiritual reliance? We know that our food is from God's own providence, but do we simply give thanks for our food? Or do we allow that providence to inform all aspects of our lives? When we say thanks for our food, when we say a blessing before a meal, we have gratitude, but God wants us to go deeper than gratitude. If all we're doing is thanking God for what He's given and not acknowledging those gifts as invitations to go deeper in our relationship with Him, then we're passing up so much else that He's trying to give us. And perhaps so much else that He's trying to give others through us. He provides everything and longs for a connected relationship with us. And often we just stop at saying, thank you, and go on our way. back to food itself and the fact that food was at the beginning and the end. Food was at the beginning, that passage from Genesis, as part of the garden, the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam and Eve all sorts of trees to eat from. He said they could eat from all of them except one. Adam and Eve were involved in cultivation and agriculture even before they sinned and rebelled against God. The need to grow things and eat the need to sustain ourselves for health and strength is not just part of the sinful fallen world. It's also part of God's original design. The goodness of food, God's desire to provide, was even present before we were separated from Him. And at the end, just as at the beginning, we still have this need and God provides it. In the meantime, we can still find God's presence in the normal, often mundane act of eating. Whether the food is dry leftovers or a beautifully prepared and presented entree, it still shows us signs of God's kingdom. Whether the food is a joy or a chore, it still shows signs of God breaking through and providing. 
Sometimes with beauty, sometimes with simple utilitarian sustenance. Sometimes we have this kind of relationship with our dinner where it just looks so good that if you don't like mushrooms, that doesn't look good. That we have to get that picture of it. But sometimes, especially in families, we have this kind of relationship for our dinner. <laughs> Thank you, moms and dads who cook out there. But even when we are tired of something like leftovers, we need nourishment. Tired like the Israelites in the desert of that manna. We need nourishment. Even when we are worn out by something, we still need to produce it. The most mundane food and most mundane culinary efforts still come from the remarkable process of production. They still do the remarkable work of sustaining our bodies. God doesn't only act through food when it's a pretty Instagram picture. He acts through food in the most basic of ways. Even in the desert, the Israelites ate the same thing every day, and I'm sure they got tired of it, but they kept eating it. They called it manna, which literally means, what is it? When the little Israelite kids would ask, what is it for dinner tonight, Mom? They would sigh and say, yes, yes, again. But even in that, we are still reminded of God's blessings through the drudgery of life. In fact, it is through some of the most basic items that Jesus specifically told us to remember Him and to remember our relationship with Him. Bread and wine. At the Last Supper, Jesus did not give His disciples filet mignon and truffles and say, when you eat this, I am with you. He wouldn't be with us very often. No, He gave them the most basic everyday items and said, when you eat this, even when you eat this, I am with you. He's not just with us when things are tasty and pretty, when things are upbeat and going well, when we've got lots of wonderful pictures to share on Instagram. He's with us when we're just finding whatever we can in the pantry or on another day of leftovers in the fridge. We're just trying to figure out a way to get whatever nourishment we can get today just to get through the day. That's when He's with us. He's with us even then. And the day after that meal... Jesus died so that we could truly, really know the blessings, the nourishment, the beauty even in the mundane that God longs to give us. Because when He is willing to forgive even our worst, even the smallest taste of the kingdom can move us and motivate us and strengthen us and point us to the many other glories that He longs to share. So when we sit down to our next meals, and the next ones, and the next ones, and even if those next ones are the same thing as the previous ones, let us not simply give thanks, but draw closer to the one who provides, who is literally dying to give us what we need so that we may know him, and who longs to equip us to show that love to the world. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are grateful for what you provide. And even when we lose sight of it, uh, we ask that you can give us your Holy Spirit to provide that little taste, the little spark, the reminder of how much more you long to give, how you long to use us to give to others. Point us toward Jesus who gave himself for us. And even gave us some of the most mundane things by which to remember Him. Help us see Your glory in the mundane. So that we may always know Your presence, Your love, and Your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.